It's coming in on, you know, it's noon. <laughs> okay, I'm going to just go ahead and start. I'm so excited today for our Black History Month to actually honor two of our very own in Kalamazoo who are trailblazers and have been doing wonderful work and who just stand out, not just here, but actually stand out in the country as leaders for healthcare organizations. Um, and I just can't, I get bubbly all over when I kind of talk about you two or think about you two being here because uh, you're, doing, you're unique, you're trailblazers, and the work you're doing sets an example for so many others. So thank you, thank you, thank you for your leadership. So I first like to introduce um, Denise Crawford. And Denise Crawford uh, is the CEO and president of the Family Health Center here in Kalamazoo. Denise uh, has an MBA and her MSW, and she actually has led the Family Health Center since 2009. Steadily, what she's done is expanded the center's ability to deliver quality health care to an underserved population in greater Kalamazoo area. Under her leadership, Prior also to joining Family Health Center, she was the Director of Physician Services and Ambulatory Care at Borges or Ascension Health. Um, and previously, previously to that, she served on a number of committees and, and roles for um, Ascension or Borges Health, including being the Director of Strategic Initiatives and Cor Cor Corporative Services, the Director of Borges Family Med Medicine and Director of Ambulatory Behavioral Medicine Services and other physicians. She's got so much. This is so much she's done. <laughs> Ms. Crawford received an Executive Master of Business Administration, MBA, from none other than the University of Notre Dame. Master's of Social Work degree from WMU and a Bachelor of Science from WMU. She's a Kalamazoo native and she stayed here. She's doing the work and she's expanded the camp. I can't stop talking about you, Denise. Family Health Center now has more than one location. She's done stuff with Cradle. She's just done stuff to make a difference. So I am so happy that you are actually here and we can honor you in some way to actually let the world, our world, know more about you. Thank you so much, Denise. Thank you, thank you, Cheryl. You are so, so generous. I really appreciate it. I think from this point on, we need to have you introduce me for everything. <laughs> it's, an awesome it's truly a pleasure to be here with you and the students. And so I'm just going to jump right in um, so that we can uh, save time for, for my dear friend and colleague, Bill, and then open it up to a question and answer. Can I just wait for one minute, though, Denise? I'd like to also have the privilege of introducing Bill so <laughs> because I won't be here for that transition, <clears throat> but I'm going to see the recording and I just have to introduce you to, I have to, I'm sorry. <laughs> Somebody else could have done it, but I want to do it. So Bill <laughs> Mann is the president mm -hmm. and chief executive officer for Bronson Healthcare System. I'm going to say it again, system, the largest employer and leading healthcare system in Southwest Michigan. As the senior executive, he oversees a full range of services from primary care to critical care across more than 100 locations. Manns joined Bronson in 2020 and has nearly 30 years of experience in healthcare leadership. He graduated from the University of Michigan with a bachelor's degree in organizational psychology and a master's degree in health services administration. In addition to his healthcare specific background, he is experienced in Lean and Six Sigma. His current profession, professional memberships include the National Association of Healthcare Executives, the American College of Healthcare Executives, and an appointment by the governor of Michigan to the Public Health Advisory Council. Mr. Mann serves on several boards, including ours for the medical school, um, we're so happy to have you, um, Mr. Pans, on our board um, throughout the state of Michigan, not just here, um, including Michigan Health and Hospital Association, Michigan Health uh, Hospital Association Service Corporation, Affirmative Health Partners, 
Bronson Health Foundation, Cascade Engineering, First National Bank of Michigan, Gilmore Car Museum, <laughs> Southwest Michigan First, and Western Can Michigan City, Homer Striker, MD School of Medicine. We are so happy to have you too. And now my time to stop talking and let you all present. Thank you so much again for the privilege. Thank you, thank you. I'm gonna turn it over to Denise, so please. Thank you so much. As we're setting this up here, I just want to make sure we got and, and as we do a quick check, is everyone okay with the with the sound? You yes. sound great. Excellent. Excellent. So, you know, thank you again for allowing me to participate in the speaker series and just really excited to be here. Um, throughout this time, I'm going to tell you a little bit about the Family Health Center history. And then, of course, a little bit about me with snippets of my leadership style really woven in between uh, the process. So as we look at the story of the Family Health Center, it's truly one of community commitment, diversity, as well as execution. And I think as we go through this, you will see these various aspects take place. So interestingly enough, it was early, Family Health Center was formed in 1971. Um, but interesting, at that particular time, uh, we redlining had taken place. And so if you recall this discriminatory practice, and it really set out to deem areas as being hazardous and, and very challenging to invest in, if you will. And so within Kalamazoo County, and particularly within the city, we experienced a number of professionals leaving the city of Kalamazoo and transitioning to the suburbs. And oftentimes you will have this referred to as white flight, but really it had a devastating effect. So during this time, we started to notice, or the community started to notice some pretty significant healthcare problems and trends taking place, really associated with individuals on the north side of Kalamazoo. And so um, uh, the Upjohn Institute, uh, did a study and it concluded that the members of the North Side were not receiving adequate health care. Now it's important to note that there was one African American physician um, and, and truly noted as a, as a trailblazer and a true commitment to this community and that was Dr. Cornelius Allen Alexander. And so Dr. Alexander remained committed to the community. He never left. Interestingly enough, his doctor, uh, the, the doctor office of the building in which he occupied um, continues to stand. It's at 118 West North Street, if those are who are interested, but it still remains in the community today. But needless to say, there were over 10,000 individuals that really needed access to health care, and there was no way that Dr. Alexander could manage that volume of individuals. So in typical for, uh, for Kalamazoo as a whole, um, and I think that's what we love about this community. I will tell you as we quickly go through the history here, you will see the, the true commitment and the expediency associated with um, correcting the problem. And as we still see today via the, you know, the $100 million donation that perhaps formed, um, allowed the formation of WMED, um, the $500 million donation um, to Western Michigan University recently, the Kalamazoo Promise, the list goes on and on. The philanthropic community within Kalamazoo remained very committed. So within this timeline, and I won't walk through the whole thing, but you will see how that it was identified that there was not enough care being received on the north side. Community members came together. Interestingly, uh, they took the opportunity to reach out to the community, ask them specifically, what is it that you need? What's important to you? Um, and there was an overwhelming response. And um, the, the notes showed that there were over 250 individuals directly from the north side that responded to this um, focus group. And they said, very clear uh, uh, requirements. They wanted individuals that look like them. 
They wanted individuals who worked with, to work with them, who cared about them, who were compassionate about the care of them and their family members, who could talk to them in a way in which they understood. And so thus, ultimately, the Family Health Center was born. Um, it was initially named the Free Health Care Clinic. And that actually opened up in around 1972. Now, in about 1974, you will see is the actual building was constructed. So prior to that time, services were actually delivered in a trailer. Um, but by 1974, interesting, in the same location in which Family Health Center is located today, the Family Health Center building was constructed. By 1986, you will see that they were serving nearly 11,000 individuals, and it happened to be about a third, a third, a third. A third of those patients were pediatric patients. About a third of those patients were adult patients. Um, one in four of the women were pregnant and receiving prenatal care, and then about a third of the patients were geriatric patients as well. So they continue to operate very successfully um, in providing services to the community. Um, you will see that, you know, in 1997, they even established a migrant summer school program, again, with a focus on those most uh, disadvantaged within the community. And then as time progressed, you will see in 2009, they hired a new president and CEO. And so this was the youngest, uh, president and CEO of the organization and an African-American woman by the name of Denise Crawford. Um, interestingly to, uh, to say, those were extremely, extremely valuable times. And even I didn't realize it. I, I entered the center. I was very committed. I wanted to give back to the community that had invested so much in me. Um, and so we were able to negotiate a, a contract that, that worked for both of us. But more importantly, during this time, keep in mind in 2008 is when the bubble had burst. And so our country as a whole was experiencing significant challenge, if you will. Uh, president Barack Obama had been elected president. And so he had this focus on health care for all, health care reform, access for all. At that particular time, none of us really knew what it looked like, but he there was a lot of communication regarding expanding access for 26 million, for an additional 26 million individuals. What was interesting is that the Obama administration put significant focus on federal qualified health centers with the understanding that as they expanded access, they wanted to ensure that we they had healthcare facilities for these individuals to actually come to and receive quality health care. And it was at that time that Obama, uh, President Obama, really um, dedicated $54 billion to federal qualified health centers across the country, again, in preparation for this health care reform. As a new CEO, I immediately began applying for these grants, not quite understanding the grant world coming from the private sector of Borges Hospital, where I'd spent the previous 20 years. And it just sounded like a really good idea, all of this uh, available, per se, money to expand, provide access, services, et cetera. Um, and, and that was not uh, the case for federal qualified health centers prior to that. So Family Health Center applied. Um, and fortunately, in 2009, um, received a notice uh, that we had been awarded the, the grant, it was the largest expansion and capital grant in the state of Michigan. But most importantly, um, it would allow Family Health Center to provide access to an additional 40,000 individuals. So this is where it all started. In doing that work, you will note that um, a very, very critical component uh, was within the Family Medicine Residency Program being equally committed to the community. They, at that time, made the decision to partner and collaborate with the Family Health Center and relocate the entire family practice residency to uh, the Family Health Center in this new expanded facility, again, focusing on the community and ensuring that access was available. Interestingly, 
Um, time continued to pass. We were able to open the facility. The facility did quite well. We provided services to the individuals. And in 2016, we began to construct a new state-of-the-art healthcare facility now on the south side of Kalamazoo in which the data showed that the underserved population was continuing to grow and the largest need was on the south side. And so that's where we actually host our Elcott facility, another 75,000 square feet state-of-the-art facility um, here in Kalamazoo. So very proud to be able to offer both of these locations as well as our dental facility on the north side and our mobile clinics. But as we quickly turn, um, you know, one of the key elements with leadership is understanding the commitment to your staff and to you as a whole, making sure that you stay connected and focused on the work in which you've been designed to do. So a little bit about me, um, as indicated, and again, I thank Dr. Dixon for that phenomenal introduction. Um, I am uh, uh, an MSW as well as an MBA. And those are, are pretty uncommon um, degrees um, in, 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 in joint, so to speak. However, it has worked extremely well for my um, particular interest as well as training um, because it, I, I, I very much am committed to the individuals and truly understanding um, the focus and the commitment and the social determinants on health um, and, and working diligently. Uh, my life's work has really been to, to provide health equity for all, but then also the business component really fulfills my desire and my, um, you know, my quest to, to understand and to make things happen and to expand a, a, across the entire um a conundrum of, of, of care uh, for all individuals. So interestingly, as Cheryl denoted, um, I started uh, my, and, and I include this because now they've closed my, my beloved alma mater, but my elementary school was St. Mary's uh, Catholic Elementary. And I say that because there's a very interesting story that really has set the pace uh, for my life. I then went on to Comstock High School where I graduated and then of course had the pleasure of ten attending Western Michigan University as a hometown Bronco and then Notre Dame. But quickly within this pause, um, I, you know, I, I, I grew up um, in a family of three girls. Uh, at the time, my mother um, was a single mother um, and we um, lived a very modest life. She worked extremely hard and she was extremely committed. Um, and she had the pleasure of working a job that really afforded her a lot of flexibility um, to spend time with us at school and to volunteer as a parent aide and, and a student, uh, you know, work with the students, et cetera. And so she was regularly up at the school. So as the story goes, um, I, I started at my elementary school and I was actually in kindergarten and I had an older sister, um, I'm the middle child, uh, who attended the same school and uh, she was two years older than me. So she was actually um, in the second grade. And so without giving all of the details, I think the quick component is, is that um, one day my mother was volunteering again and she served as room mother numerous times, but she was at the school and um, at that time, you know, we're talking a good 50 years ago plus, um, they really encouraged that you not, when you participate in the school, that you not work with your own children simply because, you know, giving your children the, the flexibility and, the, you know, the, the ability to work with others, et cetera. So long story short, she had completed with her work group and they were working on some reading programs, um, what have you. And so they rejoined a little bit early into the main classroom. Um, and so within that classroom, this is the second grade classroom, the students were um, preparing to transition to the next lesson, which was um, the mathematics. And um, she noticed that my older sister um, began 
cleaning off the tables and was very astute. You know, she knew where the squirt bottle was. She went and got the rags, et cetera, et cetera. Now, interestingly enough, this is 1970s. Um, so, you know, it's about 74. So, so pretty late on. We don't always think about this, but my sister was cleaning off the tables. And so she began to watch and my sister continued to clean and the other kids were lining up. And then my sister began to get the snacks and kind of put them out at the tables, et cetera, et cetera. And so she said to my sister, well, you know, it, it's time for you to gather, go and get with the other kids. And my sister kind of looked puzzled at her. And she said, okay, um, you know, let's go, let, let's go, let's get it going. And she indicated, my sister indicated that I don't, I don't go there, mom. And then one of the friends who was also in the classroom, another child at two, she stated to my mother, she said, uh, so and so, I, I won't say her name, but let's say her name is Polly. Um, she said, Polly, Polly doesn't go to the math class. Polly cleans up after us. And my mother, of course, was devastated to realize that my sister in second grade was actually used to clean up and take care and partake of the other students. And so devastated, keep in mind, she whisked my sister up. She came down to my kindergarten classroom, whisked me up, and we never returned to that school system. Now, interestingly, you know, my mother had been raised in the South, and so she um, understood of uh, the concept of not making ways, if you will, and staying within your place. So she did not know anything about the ability to go to the school board or the ability to, um, you know, get an attorney, et cetera, et cetera. All she knew was that she was focused on ensuring that her children had equity and the best possible chance in the world to be successful from her, from her perspective which leads me to St. Mary's Elementary. And so again, whereas I don't wanna belabor the story, but we were quickly whisked into St. Mary's. That became our permanent school. We were not necessarily Catholic. Um, that did not necessarily matter. At that particular time, my mother's mindset was, and I remember her saying numerous times, quote, these women are working for God and they have to do right by him. And so she felt that by instituting this and by ensuring that we were placed at Catholic um, uh, educational or academic settings, that we would get the education that not only that she did not receive, but that we deserved. So the interesting thing about that, and where is that, that I mean, it, it truly is a, a very touching story. I still get emotional thinking about it today. But what became amazing. And this is when I talk about leadership. So we joined that school. It was in the middle of, 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 you know, the school year. Keep in mind, I'm in kindergarten. And so those nuns took us under their route and we were, you know, acclimated in with the regular students. But whereas they could not change our future, they were, excuse me, they could not change our past. Amongst them, they were determined to change our future. So we went on and one of the key components was, I remember um, my mother telling me that one of the teachers had stated that this was the, the lead nun and she had stated that the one thing that we cannot do, they had done testing, et cetera, and had determined that my sister was significantly behind. But the one thing that we could not do, they indicated was break her spirit. We cannot make her appear different and we will be able to get her back on track. So my mother was devastated. We got two years to make up, et cetera. In their effort to not make her different, they decided that anything that she did that I would need to do to equalize it. And so our future began. We attended Catholic school throughout the entire school year. And then the summers we would go and stay up at Nazareth College at this time where the nuns stayed. And we would continue to have school. From the time I was in kindergarten until the fifth grade, I never had a break and did not know what a summer break consisted of. I only say that to say that as we regained and continued, 
I was placed, by the time I reacclimated into public schools, I was identified as gifted, as you know, scoring significantly above, et cetera. But it was because of the commitment associated with these particular nuns. I remember Sister Marceline, Sister Elvira, Father Woods, the list goes on and on, who truly took us under their wing and were determined to change our future. That in and of itself is leadership. When you have the ability to make a difference, a lot of people would not associate that with leadership, but that denotes true leadership. So as we continue on, one of the key components that I love Colin Powell in his, his various quotes, the essence of leadership is holding your people to the highest possible standard while taking the best possible care of them. And so in doing that, we as leaders have to understand and remember that we have to take care of the individuals doing the work. That is part of our responsibility, making sure that we acknowledge and understand those who are making it all possible. Interestingly, you know, I, I had a, a quote, I think it was a mar magazine article, and they had asked me, if you could have dinner with anyone, who would you choose uh, to talk to, to pick their brain, et cetera? And I had selected Oprah Winfrey and President Barack Obama. And the reason being is because they both were significant trailblazers. They were first. They had to go in very uncharted waters, do things that had never been done before. But interestingly enough, they did it with, and they continue to do it with grace, with dignity, with passion, and with respect. And so regardless what individuals think about them, I think it will be hard pressed to find people who do not um, associate them with the true ethics and the true values in which they led. So what are leadership to me? Some of the key components, I think it's important to stay focused, stay true to yourself, stay true to your values, stay true to your mission. Most importantly, you have to stay humble. You will always, you will be fraught with all different types of obstacles and no different than the obstacle that, you know, my beloved, uh, you know, Sister Marceline, et cetera, was faced with. Whereas they could not necessarily take on the educational system, they could not take on that school, but they were able to identify what impact did they have control over? What could they do? What could they inspire? And ultimately change the life and the life of many others as a result of it. So how it all started. Interestingly, you'll see a picture of me. Um, and this is, this is around, I don't know, two or three. Um, there's a picture of me in college. And then that was my very first day. That was my badge picture at Family Health Center in 2009. And then interestingly here, you see this was a video we did actually last week. Um, so a little bit of change, but, but obviously still the same person. More importantly, uh, when we look at Family Health Center as a whole, you will see how we started in a trailer. And at that time, I'm not sure anyone could imagine um, the leaps and bounds and the impact um, that we would be able to have on the community today. But it continues to show the various family health center um, sites where our Alcott facility, that's our newest facility, our Patterson facility, the Moses L. Walker building, uh, one of our founding fathers who served on the board for 47 years, our dental facility, and then the two mobile cl clinics. So as I look at leadership, you know, and this just really holds truth to me, you may not choose the opportunity or the obstacle that you're faced with, but as a leader, you always choose the outcome. And so that's what I think we have to understand and take true to when you look at leadership is that you determine the ending of the story. You determine, do you take the easy road do you take the road less traveled or do you do what's right? Do you make a difference? Do you stand up that dignity, that respect? Do you stay committed to those ethics? So we can't talk about leadership and we definitely cannot talk about healthcare without mentioning this pandemic. Um, and I don't know that any of us in healthcare ever could have prepared for it or ever could have um, imagined uh, what would have came. But I will tell you that as a leader, I could not have been prouder and I continue to be proud as I acknowledge our phenomenal team of healthcare providers from the physicians to the patient assistants to the 
registration staff, front desk, and everything in between, they were phenomenal. I was so impressed with the work, with the commitment, with the dedication that our team had to ensuring that our community uh, remained safe, remained educated, and we continue to remain accessible. Um, many of our providers came to me during that time, and their focus was we took an oath. This is why we have trained. This is what we have prepared for. And we are here to serve the hardest and the most, um, most disproportionately uh, marginalized individuals in our community, many of which had black and brown skin. To date, Family Health Center has provided more than 15,000 COVID-19 vaccines to the most devastated areas in Kalamazoo County, birth, both urban and rural. We continue to provide about 2,000 vaccines a month, um, and that has never stopped through our ongoing cl uh, clinics and, and various partnerships. So Bronson Health, I cannot talk about the pandemic without sharing the phenomenal partnership um, and commitment of Bronson Healthcare. Um, it was in the heart of the pandemic. Um, we were all suffering. We were still in the, the, the guises of, you know, maintaining PPE, keeping people safe, et cetera, et cetera. And the vaccine had finally been released. And so as a federal qualified health center, I had received vaccine to ensure that we could take care of our frontline providers. And so we were so appreciative of that. The federal government went above and beyond and then made sure that the people doing the work uh, remain safe and protected so that we could continue in the work and, and care for the patients. However, I did not, because we were a federal qualified health center, and of course, naturally and respectfully, the first vaccines went to the hospitals. They had to. Those were where the sickest patients were. And so the, the vaccines, excuse me, for distribution. And so Family Health Center, we did not have access to vaccine. Meanwhile, we were constantly receiving, you know, studies and reports of how um, individuals with black and brown skin, inner city individuals were disproportionately affected. They were dying at record rates. Um, they did not have the protection along with a lot of others, but we could not do anything. We had people asking, we had our seniors who were concerned, et cetera, but there was nothing we could do. That was right up until I received a call from Bronson Healthcare. And this in my mind is leadership at its best. And it was through the leadership of Bronson that it scanned and realized that they had access to the vaccine, albeit limited, but there was a group of individuals within our community that met the guidelines of the age and the, you know, the geriatric guidelines, but they did not have access. And so they reached out to us as Family Health Center and said, hey, can we partner with you? Keep in mind at this time, we did not know the first day. We were we wanted to do it. We had had a lot of experience in doing vaccination clinics, uh, excuse me, it's doing testing clinics, but we, did, we had not worked with the vaccine, which was very, very meticulous. Not only did they say, we want to help you, we want to help you get to your most vulnerable patients. We wanna help you get the vaccine out, but we will send you the staff to partner with you to teach you how to manage the vaccine, how to distribute, how, et cetera, et cetera. And so we were able to take those two services, our expertise in these mobile health infrastructure um, clinics and Bronson's expertise. And through that partnership, we ensured that our most vulnerable individuals had access to the vaccine. Our very first event, we serviced over 500 individuals and it continued to just grow and grow and grow from that standpoint. So clearly, clearly a highlight for me um, throughout the event. The other piece I will add is our partnership with Mothers of Hope was proved to be invaluable at getting at the community. Now, you will notice quite interestingly in these pictures that we normally don't necessarily choose local beer and liquor uh, facilities of where we would go and provide our health care services. But we knew that through this, in order to get to the most vulnerable, it was going to be critical that we connect with people who were not only involved and, and truly um, 
respected within the community, but they had what's often referred to as street credibility, meaning people trusted them, people followed them, people wanted to be connected with them. And they had that, that um, infrastructure. And whereas we lived um, from a facility standpoint within these particular areas, we did not have the same street credibility. So this partnership proved to be invaluable. They got us to numerous people because by them coming forth and essentially saying, we trust, then we could provide the medical care, we could set up the facilities, we could pop up the clinics, and we popped up hundreds of clinics all across the city, again, in the most vulnerable areas to ensure that everyone had access. Um, so extreme kudos to Mothers of Hope and Bronson, and equally important to our staff who went everywhere. So as we transition, um, because things continue to happen and you have to be prepared for that as a leader, we also celebrated our 50 years. So we're in the midst of a global pandemic and Family Health Center turns 50 years. And so it was important to acknowledge that because 50 years is pretty monumental and we would never get those 50 years back. So in 2021, we turned 50. And our way in which we decided, how do we celebrate our 50 years? And as opposed to have another large event where we were concerned about social distancing, et cetera, et cetera, we decided let's take it to the streets, if you will. Let's go to the community that has helped us to sustain for 50 years, that has trusted us and that has partnered with us. And we launched our 50 years, our 50 acts of kindness to truly acknowledge our 50 years. And with that, we were able to do really unique events all throughout the city and really try to infuse some positivity um, as we participated in this celebration. So throughout this, you will see how we were at grocery stores um, and we would just pay for people's groceries. And we went to the gas station and we just pay for people's gas. And we went to the Y and we would pay for people's memberships. We gave out free diapers. We went to restaurants. It was important. We really focused on our community as a whole and giving back to them as they have given so much to us as we celebrate those 50 years. So as we looked upon the pandemic and truly the challenges that have taken place um, from inflation and understanding our staff and understanding um, the commitments that they've made with boots on the ground, uh, as leaders, keep in mind, it's always important to take care of the individuals in which you are leading. And so we were able to take a proposal to our board, and I am so proud and honored that the board endorsed it 100%. And it involved raising the salary of every single individual within the organization, minimum 30%, and we raised some all the way up to 50%. Today, I am proud to note that the lowest salary within the Family Health Center is $18 an hour. Um, that actually is the, the wage that is assigned to our custodial staff, um, and that's straight entering through the door, no experience, um, no, no, no previous um, employment, oftentimes history. But we are able to offer individuals $18 an hour, um, again, as an act of respecting them and respecting the living wage and the necessity um, to operate efficiently in this environment. And next, we are opening and proud to reopen our Family Health Center Training Institute. And this is really preparing for the future. But this is an opportunity where we take individuals within the community all throughout our county who are interested in working within healthcare. Um, we take them through an accredited 22-week program where they receive both didactic, hands-on, as well as classroom education right on site. And during that time, we pay them a full salary and wage. So they are able to obtain their education while receiving um, uh, a salary so that they don't have to give up their, well, they do give up their current employment, but they don't have to give up um, their income. And they're able to enter the medical field with hands-on training and a hands-on approach. At the conclusion, we offer them a guaranteed employment up to three years. Most importantly, they leave with the skill, with education, with income, and no student debt. So we're so pleased to be able to launch this and we are relaunching um, this program 
uh, in June of this year, the Family Health Center Training Institute. So as I conclude, you know, I truly believe in this and you will say, see that I have taken so many snippets from Colin Powell, who was just a phenomenal, phenomenal leader. But leadership is all about people. It's not about organizations. It's not about plans. It's not about strategies, all of which are very important and have to take place. But it is about the people, motivating the people to get the job done. If you're going to be a leader, you have to be people-centered. Thank you so much. And I, along with you, I am so pleased to now turn it over to my dear friend and colleague, Mr. Bill Mance. And I want to thank you, Denise, for all the work and your presentation. And uh, Ms., uh, Mr. Bill Manns, I've already introduced you, and we can't wait to hear from you. I just want to ask if you do have your camera on with the speakers, if you could turn it off, because that will help the, us to just really focus on the speaker. Turn your cameras on when you have questions, which we hope we'll have time for uh, questions at the end. Thank you, everyone. That's great. So uh, can you guys see my um, uh, screen? Yes. Yes. Okay, screens. good. Then let's go ahead and get started. All right. So, um, and I, you know, before I start, I do want to say um, my intention is not to offend anyone. So hopefully no one is offended uh, or not to shock anyone, but uh, I have had a, um, uh, an interesting career. Let's put it that way. So I'm going to do a couple of disclaimer slides as we start. Uh oh. Not advancing here. I don't think the PowerPoint's up yet, but we can see your screen. Uh, okay, let me let me let me restart then. Bear with me, guys. And, and what about now? Yes, we can see. All right, cool. So my first disclaimer slide. So I, um, as you will see, I lived in California for a number of years. And this is a slide of uh, me looking out past my deck in the back. A uh, couple levels, the uh, hot tub down there, et cetera. So a really nice view. And this is a view uh, when I moved to West Michigan. So uh, if you don't like snow like I don't, uh, you may think maybe this guy isn't that bright. Um, let's talk a little bit about my journey. So what I plan to do today is talk briefly about Bronson, a little bit about me, some leadership lessons, how we really need to improve the health status of our community, and talk about being an African-American leader um, and then give uh, some advice that I got from three wise men. So you guys know Bronson. We're a fairly large uh, healthcare organization. Uh, we started in 1900. Uh, there are over 8,600 employees that work for Bronson, which is amazing, and uh, 72 locations. Um, Here's some of our sites, a number of joint venture partnerships, uh, West Michigan Cancer Center, um, WMED. Um, so we, we really like to partner. We are the first choice for acute care. So you look at um, our market share. So we definitely lead the market. Um, Spectrum's next, followed by Ascension Borges, Michigan Medicine, and then Oakland. So a little bit about me. Um, so while, yeah, I had a four-year free ride to Michigan State uh, academic scholarship. And as you heard, I went to Michigan, so go blue. My dad didn't talk to me for about two weeks um, after I made that decision. Um, what you don't know, though, is that I was supposed to be the co-star in a movie. Uh, it was a documentary, uh, and it was about 24 hours in the life of a healthcare administrator. And literally about midway through uh, the shooting schedule, the producer came to me and said, you know, Bill, you guys are in lots of meetings, and it's pretty boring. I'm not sure we're going to do this. Um, and I turned to him and said, Nick, I understand. And he said, I'm going to go down to the emergency department and see if there are any interesting stories there. And he did, and he created this movie um, called The Waiting Room. Uh, I'm not in it, um, but I strongly encourage you to see it. And it's right before uh, the Affordable Care Act. And it talks a lot about how people really went to the ED to seek primary care. Um, I've done a ton of turnarounds in my career. Um, most recently, we did a significant turnaround in California that got a lot of national attention um, so much so that the uh, magazine Fast Company picked it up and they came out and uh, they took literally hundreds of pictures of me and my boss. And so I did my best ebony man poses and really excited about it. And, um, and so I asked the photographer, why are you doing this? And he said, well, it's what we usually do uh, when we put people on the cover. 
was like, wow, on the cover, this is great. Um, and so I called my mom. I said, mom, you know, you got to get Fast Company in February when it comes out. She's like, why? Just trust me. You called all my friends. Make sure you get Fast Company when it comes out. Yeah, uh, LeBron James was on the cover. And so I called back and said, hey, you remember the pictures of the Ebony Man? And what's the deal? Why? And the, uh, the, the editor starts laughing. And he said, really, Bill? You guys are LeBron James. It's not even close. So I, I like to, uh, to stay humble. Um, in uh, elementary school, so Denise mentioned elementary school. I went to a Catholic high, uh, elementary school and a Catholic high school. This is my girlfriend. Uh, those of you who are in the know know that that's Aaliyah. Um, so absolutely beautiful um, uh, singer. And hopefully you don't believe that that was my girlfriend because here I am, uh, a true nerd looking like Al Sharpton um, in that particular picture. So uh, yeah. There are two women in my life, my mom to the left, my lovely wife who actually did make the cover of a magazine. Um, here's my son. Um, and the first time I showed this picture, somebody said, oh, your son likes Maze in Blue too. Yeah, and I'm thinking, no, uh, the other guy's my son with the blonde dreads. Uh, many of you know that uh, next to him is Big Sean, who really isn't that big. And if Big Sean was my son, I probably wouldn't be working now. And there's my son next to, uh, to Sean's mother too. Son, uh, here he is next to Sister Jean. He goes to Loyola in Chicago. Great kid. All right, let's start with the lessons, leadership lessons. Um, one of the very first uh, things that I learned, I went to uh, University of Detroit Jesuit High School. Father Richard Polakowski said, Bill, you need to say what you know. You need to say what you don't know. You need to question all that you believe. Then you need to label accordingly and examine fearlessly. But above all else, be a man for others. You got to remember that this this life isn't about you. Um, it's about him and you've got to really look out for your fellow man. Um, second lesson, I think it's really important that we all take risk. Um, I'm born and raised in Detroit. The furthest west that I had been at the time was Ann Arbor um, and nothing was west of Ann Arbor in my mind. And I had an opportunity to take a job to uh, go to California and I was scared to leave and I would only talk to people who agreed that I should stay um, in Detroit and not go anywhere. And if anyone said, no, go west, young man, I wouldn't listen. And so I love this note from Proverbs. Stupid people always think they're right. Wise people listen to advice. Um, part of the reason I didn't want to go west was fear. Um, fear of failure. And so I used my move to the west coast to really help me get that courage and, and used it as a motivator. Um, and I think far too many people really get stuck and they, they, they get so scared. They get scared of losing their job. What happens? They lose their job. They, they get scared of losing their spouse. What happened? They get divorced. And so living with that life of fear is, uh, is tough. And I love this Victor Frankl quote. Uh, translation's a little weird, but fear may come true that which one is afraid of. So in other words, don't give your fears too much power. So I mentioned going to to, uh, to the West Coast and I went to, um, to work at Alameda County Medical Center and yeah, these are losses. And so um, a 16.2% operating margin loss meant that they lost $52 million um, when I got there, which is just unbelievable. Part of the challenge, um, they had had 11 CEOs in 10 years. So as you look at this slide, my favorite one is uh, CEO E. Um, so he didn't even make it a full month. Uh, it was the craziest environment that, that I've ever worked in. Uh, right Lasseter, he started September of uh, 2005. He hired me about a month after he started and we embarked on a, a turnaround uh, that I'm gonna tell you a little bit about um, as we go through some of these slides. Um, you know, when I got there, it was like, wow, people were complaining all over the place that uh, people were hoping we could get it turned around, but not really sure. As you see in this slide, we were able to get it significantly turned around and, and made um, a decent amount of money that we reinvested into the organization. Well, part of the way we did it was really true leadership. Um, a lot of those prior CEOs and, and COOs, really people said, OK, I got to listen to you because you're the boss. And, and they really behave that way, like I'm a boss and you got to do what I say. But yeah, it's not leadership. Um, for me, everything, and I do mean everything, rises or falls on leadership. 
but but people don't know what leadership is and, and often don't know where to start. Um, and as a black man, what role does race play uh, as people look at me, you know, why should I follow you? What? Well, part of what um, is really important to me is developing relationships and, and people have to follow and work with you because they want to, as opposed to because you're the CEO. And so how do you do that? And it's something we don't spend enough time talking about. Denise touched on it, and it's this notion of trust. Everything starts with trust. And so for me, trust is foundational, um, and especially as a leader of color. So your word needs to be your bond. So uh, Booker T. Washington said it this way, few things help an individual more than to place responsibility on him and then to let him know that you trust him. But I've also heard CEOs say things like this. I hire talented people and get out of their way. I'm paying grown men and women to do their job. I shouldn't have to micromanage. I'm hands off until the sugar, honey, and iced tea hits the fan. Well, it's not leadership. Um, when I think about leadership, I think about coaching. I uh, think about if an NBA coach said, well, you know, these stars make millions of dollars. They just get out of their way. Or, well, they're grown men and women. I don't need to tell them what to do. But as you think about it, when's the last time you saw a coach hit the winning shot, all right? The coach leads and guides. Now, I talked a little bit about um, moving to California. Well, when I first came back uh, to Michigan, I came to Grand Rapids. And uh, it was an arduous process, and I was flying back and forth. Got to be really cool, um, young black man who worked at the Enterprise Counter. So my last trip, um, it was with my, my wife and son. And he looked at me, he was like, man, you hear a lot. And I was like, yeah, but you won't be seeing me because I got the job. And he's like, oh, you got the job? Oh, well, congratulations. That's what's up. Gave him a pound, you know, and he's like, doing what? I was like, well, you know, I work in administration. What kind of administration? Healthcare administration. Doing what? And my son's like, tell him, dad, tell him. Well, I'm the president of um, Ursula St. Mary's. And he gives me this strange look and he says, what? He says, you do know that that's where black people go to die. And my son, who was 13 at the time, was like, cool, we can get back on a plane and head back to Cali, Dad. Um, he didn't want to be in Michigan anyway. And, and I, I was just shocked by that perception because um, I had done research and I heard Grand Rapids was supposed to be a, a great place, um, hot housing market, um, one of the 14 top destinations on your travel bucket list between Micronesia and Peru, uh, Grand Rapids, right, and Lake Michigan. Uh, one of the best places to visit in, actually the number one place to visit in the United States back in 2015. Well, you go, okay, well, Bill, what about Kalamazoo? So I did some research in Kalamazoo. We are ranked the coolest place in the U.S. with the lowest cost of living. One of the best places to live, according to U.S. News and World Report. But, as you guys know, in our communities of color, higher rates of obesity, kidney disease, low birth weight babies, infant, higher infant mortality, and then there's this. I used to get this a lot. Bill, how did you get to be the president of St. Mary's? And it's the inflection on the you, right? If you're white or black or young or old. And I just had this happen to me at DNW. Um, young man said, oh, you're pretty well dressed. What do you do? Work in administration, doing what? You know, you go down the list, okay, I'm the CEO at Bronson. He looks at me like, you know what? And just a look. Right. And you wonder what's going on. And then this article came out well, in Grand Rapids. It's the second worst place in the nation for African-Americans from an economic perspective. And so what it really is was a city within a city, depending upon whether you're white or a person of color. For me, um, it, it, it does. It gets really personal. I'll go to the barbershop and somebody go, oh, wow, you're a new. And they'll run to their car and they'll come back with a with their resume, right? And I'll take that resume, give it first. I give them the CEO speech you learn in CEO school. Thanks for your resume. Um, I can't promise you a job. However, I can give it to our human resource department, and I promise you somebody will get back to you. Well, when I went to do that in, in Grand Rapids, what I saw, they'd hire them. And I'd be like, whoa, whoa, whoa. I, I don't know this person. I just I'm passing their resume on. Well, no, Bill, that's how we do it. What's how we do it? Well, it, it's really kind of referral based and you got to really know somebody to get. And I thought, wow, that's not, huh. 
So we had to change the structure and approach of human resources several times until we got the right people. We also looked outside the industry um, to see how others did it. We came up with something that was called the evidence-based selection process. I don't have a lot of time to go into it here, but suffice it to say, to the extent humanly possible, driving bias out of the hiring process is what we did. Part of the reason I wanted to do that is when I went to Michigan, um, I had a professor, Richard Lichtenstein, who said, if you want to improve someone's health status, give them a job. So when we took bias out of the hiring process, because I used to say, well, we need to reflect the diversity of the communities we serve, right? Which sounds good, but no, let's take bias out and see what happens. Because, you know, I, it, it could have been that, you know, uh, the, the number of people of color that we hire would go down. This is what happened in a very short period of time. Those of you who can't see the slides. So I started in 2013 and in 2012, 21% of our hires were people of color. 2013, that went to 24. When I left in 2016, 38% of all of our new hires were people of color. Differently, um, I was at a, a corporate office and our uh, chief human resource officer said, do you realize that 100 out of every 300 new hires is a person of color? Kind of shocked me, you know, and so and I said, well, so it's not fear of a black planet, is it fear of a diverse planet? And so then in my own mind, you say, okay, well, wait, I don't want to be that hospital. What's this mean? Oh, no, is this a good thing? Well, yeah, it's a great thing. Our uh, rate the hospital uh, scores actually went up. Our weight, rate the practices scores went up. Our, uh, we had a reduction in terms of um, first year turnover. The time to fill vacant jobs went down. And, and so all the key metrics went in the right way. So as I prepare to close, um, I want to tell you quick stories about my three mentors. This first person is Bernard Tyson. Bernard was the president and CEO of Kaiser, a huge health system. I heard Bernard speak in San Francisco. It's about 100 of us um, healthcare leaders. And he's given a speech. And during his speech, he quoted, uh, he actually quoted from, uh, from Little Wayne, and then he quoted from Tupac. And I had to push my wine aside because I thought, obviously, I drank too much. And I'm looking around to people sitting at my table and it's like, did you? And so nobody caught it. So I went up after and I said, so uh, Bernard, you quoted from Tupac and he starts laughing. And he's like, you're right. You're probably the only person in this entire audience that caught that. And I said, yeah. So I went on to, to get to know Bernard. His advice to me is you got to be yourself. You got to be your authentic self. Um, second person, Ralph Howenstein. I met Ralph when he was a spry 101 year old. Uh, we were at the Kent Country Club having lunch. Um, we got to know each other. He started telling me war stories, dirty limericks. And at the end of our lunch, he got really quiet and he looked down. And he slowly looked up. And he said, you're a black guy. <laughs> I thought, where is this going? Did he fall asleep? Did he just realize that? What? And he looked me in the eye and he said, unfortunately, that'll matter to some people in this community. But it doesn't matter to me and it won't matter to people with character. And I guess the thing that Ralph taught me is that there are a lot of people with character who don't necessarily look like I look that I had to trust. Um, so powerful lesson. Third person, uh, you guys may or may not remember uh, Reverend Jeremiah Wright. He was Obama's uh, pastor and Obama had to walk away from him because of some of the controversial uh, sermons and things that 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 uh, Pastor Wright said I got to meet him uh, when I was in California. He and my pastor were uh, were, were acquaintances and uh, we went to brunch. And um, I, I was expecting this fiery kind of he's laid back mellow. And he said, you know, unfortunately, people will always find something to dislike you about. But you've got to hold your head high and you've got to deliver your message. So as I close, I want you to think about three things. Have you found your authentic voice and are you using it? What kind of leader do you want to be or provider or what have you? Who do you want to be? And then most importantly, what kind of legacy do you want to leave? So with that, I'm going to close and say thank you. Thank you to my friend and colleague Denise, and I'll stop sharing my screen.
and we'll open it up for questions. Thank you guys. All right. First question, anybody? Can you guys still hear us? Yep, I still hear you. I'm checking the chat now to see if you have any questions in the chat. All right, thank you. OK, we have one here. Um, what are ways you can get younger people interested in hospital administration? Mm, that's a great question. So um, I know the University of Michigan and actually I just saw a TikTok on it um, has something that they call the summer enrichment program, and it takes uh, undergraduate students and pairs them with healthcare administrators. Um, and uh, it's a paid internship for the summer. So if we're talking like, you know, uh, college age people, if you're talking high school folks, I think just exposing them um, to the mere fact that this um, this industry exists. Um, I've got a number of mentees and folks who come and shadow and I, and I think just exposure to it and realizing uh, what I call the power of the pen. Um, so the ability to um, implement policies and that kind of thing. So Denise, I don't know if you have any thoughts. No, I, I would agree with you. I think that, you know, giving people the opportunity to get in. I know locally, um, actually, the Kalamazoo Promise is um, trying to start a particular um, a mentoring event uh, with with numerous businesses. I know we at the Family Health Center have signed up, and I believe they're they're referring to it still as the Promise Keepers. And so this is also, as Bill indicated, a paid internship where individuals who have a particular interest in various um, business sectors, in our case, uh, uh, healthcare, uh, will have the opportunity to be uh, to participate and and sit in uh, a lot of that 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 space um, over the summer during this paid internship. So excellent question, thank you. Perfect. Okay, the next one, what do you think the next two years is going to look like in healthcare and for healthcare workers? <laughs> I let Denise go first. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you, my dear colleague. Uh, I, I, needless to say, I think it's anyone's guess. None of us, as I uh, briefly indicated, could have planned um, for the for the past two years, that's for sure. Um, in true transparency, I think uh, there will be an aspect of of quite a bit of healing and recalibration, meaning um, where the entire country, the entire economy, et cetera, has been affected. I feel very comfortably saying that no group has been affected um, to the level and to the degree as healthcare workers who were truly on the front lines. And so th there will have to be a lot of work and um, true intentional um, resources and effort placed on that transformational period. I truly believe they'll be okay, but you have to understand they have experienced death like no one. They have been there by the bedside. They've been there when no one else could be. They had to get up and suffer through. They did not have the two week hiatus. They never shut down for two weeks or longer. So um, really starting to recalibrate and then we'll have to do some work. There will be some transformational work that needs to take place just in the interest associated with working in healthcare, the, um, you know, the the, the trepidation, um, et cetera. I truly believe in re resilience. I'm the eternal optimist, but the next two years, I am not um, by any means, you know, uh, deprived of the work that we have ahead of us. The, the positive piece, I think, is that it will be um, transformational work and, and a transition forward. So um, we, we get to leave and become unstuck, but, but still very, very um, intentional work. Yeah. Uh, I, I I totally agree, and they're really good comments, uh, Denise. I think the the other uh, issue is the mental health toll, right? I think we're just starting to see it, not just for healthcare workers, but for the, the entire country, and um, and we've got to be responsive to that. I do think um, we're 
becoming um, more equipped to deal with uh, the coronavirus. And I think we'll have to um, learn to really manage it. Um, and, and it'll be here, uh, unfortunately. OK, what suggestions do you have to ease the fear of being authentic at, at work for those you lead? Yeah, no, I, I think you just got to do it. I mean, um, because if you if you're fake or you're trying to be someone else, you're not going to be happy and and, it, and it'll reflect in your attitude, your approach. If, if you're fake, if you are your authentic self and you end up getting fired. You weren't going to fit in eventually anyway, they were going to figure out who you are. So um, I, I just think you have to be be yourself at all times and it it reduces a level of stress, um, especially as leaders. Um, and so I've, I've had that fear like the gee, I got to fit in. Oh, is that how we do it around here? OK, and, and it is um, it eats away at your spirit. So um, I'd say be bold and be you. Great. Looks like we have a few more. Um, the next one is if you could share what was your hardest hurdle in becoming a CEO? Interesting, your hardest hurdle. Um, I think similarly to Bill, um, oftentimes, and, and particularly I will say for us as African Americans, but really leadership as a whole, uh, I, I have learned they often don't bring you in because things are going well. Um, <laughs> You are not invited, regardless what you may be showed <laughs> through those various interview visits. Um, you just need to know that that they're being you're being placed and positioned for a reason. Uh, I I think um, you know one of the sayings that goes best is one of our uh, rest is so Mr. Moses Walker, who the building is named after, and one of his key phrases to me was always that if anybody could do it, Denise, we wouldn't need you. Um, and so with those hurdles, um, you know, similarly to Bill, when I entered the Family Health Center, and I guess I would say this was one of my hardest, we were, um, for, for an organization our size, very small organization, but we were losing a million dollars. And so I entered with a budget of negative one million um, and very quickly had to figure out how do we make payroll? How do we pay for various things? How do we um, manage this and make it happen. Um, but those are the things that give you the strength, that give you the energy, that carry you through. And, you know, you can tell those stories to, you know, wonderful medical students, you know, 10, 20 years later. But um, that that probably was by far one of my most challenging, um, but equally most rewarding. Yeah, I guess I'd echo that. You know, you guys may recall the slide that I showed the number of CEOs. Um, and then Wright was, I think, uh, CEO 11, and he and I would laugh about that and say, well, I guess they tried everybody else, and now, you know, here we are. So um, I echo those comments. Okay, thank you. Um, the next question, what advice do you have for minorities that would like to be in positions of power and have an impact on the community that often feel powerless? And second half of that question is, how do you achieve that level of success when it feels like the odds are against you? Can we go back to the prior question? Sure. Because uh, I, I really like that. I'm sorry, and I will answer that one. But someone asked, what oh. level of trust do you feel? Yes, OK, community? sorry to skip that one. Yes, what yeah, level yeah. of trust do you feel the Black community has in our healthcare systems in the region? Um, my, my sense is it's probably uh, very much like the story I told. Uh, where the young man said, wow, that's the place people go to die. Um, I think there is um, some level of mistrust in healthcare systems in general um, amongst the Afri African American community. Um, and so it's incumbent upon us to reach out even more um, to catch people before they're sick, right? Um, to to really articulate um, uh, that, that healthcare is, it's okay. Uh, one of the reasons that it was so important to me um, to, to begin to recruit and hire a uh, more diverse community because many of us have grandmothers or moms, right? And wh wherever I go to work, oh, that's the best place ever. Oh my God, my grandson's here. We love, you know, and so you, you want to change that narrative of hospitals or places people go to die that, that I've often heard the African-American community or 
so and so hospital, they do kill people. And and let let's change that and get people to see it really is about health and starting to open it up. But I, I think there's a level of mistrust currently. I would echo all of that. Um, I think Bill said it perfectly. Okay. So what advice do you have for minorities that would like to be in positions of power and have an impact on the community that often feel powerless? So, you know, for me, I would I would probably reframe that and and indicate that there if there's a focus to to have power, that that may not be the 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 accurate focus, so to speak. I don't believe leadership brings you quote unquote power. Um, but if there's a focus to have influence and to have, um, you know, to be able to impact and provide positive um, transformation and, and you know, uh, within the, the community, I think it starts with truly understanding and preparing yourself via experience, via education. Um, there's a number of different ways via various groups. And it's truly, I think, understanding the community before you can go in and try to impact the community. I was very fortunate. I was born and raised in the community, but not necessarily a part, if you will, um, and uh, of the community in which I wanted to impact or where I ingrained myself within the Family Health Center. So first and foremost, you have to understand um, the community. Before you can help, before you can impact, you, you need to reach out, um, make that connection, and then truly be committed. Um, this isn't something that happens in, in a year or in six months. I, I, I truly believe you have to be focused on the long ride, and people will see that. And that's where the, the respect, uh, the honor, the trust will come. Um, but it's truly earned. Uh, I, I don't know if there's a a leader power school, so to speak. I agree with all that. I think the other um, other thing to think about is that often the people with the most power aren't those that have the position. And so um, uh, there are tons of organizations with which you can get involved and, and really make a difference. But yeah, don't think just because, you know, we, we are CEOs that we got all the power. Um, there are tons of other ways to really impact uh, positive change in the community. Okay, and the second part of that question was how do you achieve the level of success when it feels like the odds are against you? You may have answered that in your answer well, already. The, the odds are against you. I mean, it's, it's, it's and, and I think it, it is, um, um, it's the hard work, it's the commitment, it's the consistency, it's the tenacity, it, it's the, um, you just got to keep, you know, I hate to say stay on your grind, but um, there are folks, um, my street credibility, stay on your grind. So, and I, and I think it's, it's that, um, that never give up attitude and spirit. Are there strategies to help bring a more diverse population of providers to our communities? to help build trust with our patients, um, especially in OBGYN and pediatrics? Absolutely. I think there are a number of strategies. I really salute WMED as a whole, um, Dr. Dixon with a lot of her work in the pipeline programs. Um, I think there's a number of things that we can do throughout the community. Um, as within uh, a lot of various areas, having, to your point, people that look like you, um, and us making sure that we have um, openness, access, and um, a, a willingness to entrust, to support, to attract, and then retain individuals that that look like um, that look like us. You know, I will, I will lift up a story, and to your point, because you specifically mentioned um, OBGYN um, and being intentional, and simply because I'm here from Kalamazoo. Uh, I mean, born and raised, I, I had lived through uh, a number of the dyads, so to speak. Um, but there was a time when, when we, um, between numerous hospitals and we in Kalamazoo, had um, over six full-time FTE African-American OBGYNs um, available to the community. Um, and I don't think it was through any any wrongdoing, but it has to do with that knowledge and with that education. I can tell you that one of the very prominent individuals was placed in Plainwell 
um, not bad. She loved playing well, did a great job, but that probably was not the place that we would that we would put our female African American OBGYN. I can tell you a second one was placed in Portage. Again, not bad, did a wonderful job, but without having these numerous voices and oftentimes African Americans, people of color, people from the same um, region at the table, those are how, how we can make various mistakes. Um, and so we have gone from six to, to uh, I believe, um, very little or, or perhaps zero. Um, and, 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 and I think we can definitely uh, recover from that, but, but it's understanding some of those things and, and the impact that they have long-term. Well said. So, so I kind of chuckled and uh, I was debating on whether I was gonna tell this story, but I think I will briefly. Um, so two things. One, uh, my wife said, OK, Bill, uh, Mr. CEO, I need a new doctor um, and she should be in her late 40s, early 50s. She should be board certified. She should be an African-American woman. Still looking. Uh, so that's the first story. Second story, uh, Denise mentioned playing well and um, and the notion of feeling comfortable. And I'm a huge car um, fan, as many of you know. And I was looking to uh, to buy another car and went to a dealership in Plainwell and uh, gave me keys to my car, looking at this car. They went around, drove my car, um, came back while they were out. Um, the, the, a police officer, I won't say who drove in to the, the lot. He looks at me, I look at him. I'm like, oh, that's kind of cool. He must be a car person too. He started driving back out. He looks at me, I look at him. OK. They come back with my car, uh, the two salesmen. Why well, I took two people to drive my car, I don't know. Um, we go through some paperwork, they make me an offer. I say, let me think about it. I hop back in my car. I go to drive out. Oh, I see that same uh, police officer who was looking at me. I signal turn right. He pulls behind me. Oh, wow. I signal to go in and get some gas. He pulls behind me, lights him up. A license registration, do license registration thing. And he says, uh, you know, I'm pulling you over. No, sir, I don't. Well, retail fraud was committed at the mire across the street. And you match the, sus the suspect's description. And I said, wow. So you mean some guy in a suit driving a $70,000 car committed retail fraud at the mire across the street? I said, no, you know why you pulled me over, and I know why you pulled me over. And he got really quiet and went back to his car, came back in a couple minutes, threw my license at me. Um, I was pumping my gas, and the gentleman across said, hey, why did he pull you over? And I said, well, he didn't give me a ticket, and I wasn't speeding. And he said, you know, they usually don't mess with people in nice cars. So I share this story uh, because often people think, you know, that you've heard of driving while black uh, and it happens. It's happened my entire life and you think at some point it'll stop, but is what it is. So, OK, time in. <laughs> Looks like we have one more question um, and this one is what are your favorite books on business and or leadership? So I have a number of, of favorite books. It's interesting as I look over at my shelf, we have everything and, and we often have book clubs at work and I've done them over the years. And so everything from Shred and First Break All the Rules and Love Works and uh, on and on, streetwise, uh, instinct, generation, joy, the list goes on and on. As far as a favorite, I think you can glean something from each and every one of them. Um, and, and, but, but, but truly, I think that the key components are many of the things in which, you know, Bill and I have, have discussed today centered on authenticity, centered on humbleness, um, focus, commitment, determination, resilience. You know, those are the things that truly carry you as a leader. And then in, uh, again, the, the books are, are exceptional um, and they, they keep, they, they're, they're excellent reminders, I guess. They give you a framework, they give you um, kind of the, that extra jolt, that reminder, et cetera. Um, but it's really inherent to the, to the lessons learned. 
um, at the core of the work. Yeah, no, I, I think you think you're spot on, and you guys see the the books behind me um, there. I think as a leader, it's about continuous learning, and, and yeah, I read a lot, um, and so many of my mentees, I'm, I'm uh, telling them to read a book. It's called Forty Eight Laws of Power. Um, it it is a really 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 interesting book, um, and so yeah, so that's the one, and, and it and it varies. So yeah. Okay, it looks like we had another one pop up. Um, this person is wondering if you are including veterans in your hiring efforts. Yes, I think it's really important that we hire our vet, vet, veterans. Absolutely. Absolutely. All right. Echo. Ditto. Okay. Perfect. Uh, do we have any more questions anyone would like to ask? Right. Well, we are very honored to have both of you. Um, would you y'all have do you have any lasting <laughs> last um, any notes you would like to share or? You know, I, I would just conclude really the way in which uh, Bill started, and that is be authentic, uh, remain authentic, stay true to yourself. Um, and then, you know, for me, it just remains that, you know, having those values that focus on um, you know, the dignity, the respect, uh, and I think all, all else will fall into place. Um, so again, thank you. So honored uh, to be a part of this and really uh, uh, and appreciated sharing the stage, not only with, with Bill, um, but with, with WMED as a whole. And so thank you for all you do for our community too. Indeed. Yeah, I'd say the exact same thing. And the, the authenticity, you, you've got to be yourself, right? Um, and I'm really honored to have been able to share the stage with my colleague Denise and um, and WMED. Thank you for what you guys continue to do and the impact you have on our community. So really appreciate this opportunity. Yes, we thank you both for being flexible and sharing with us today. Take, I know your schedules were busy, so being flexible and <laughs> being able to commit to today. And it was it was truly inspiring to hear about both your journeys. And just uh, thank you. Take care. All right. Thank you. Yeah.